Hello, and welcome to EELE 101, and this is the introduction to C programming part of the course. I'm Dr. Ross Snyder, and I'm a professor in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at Montana State University, and this is at the Bozeman campus. Okay, so what we're going to do now is give you a broad uh, overview of what we're going to be doing in this uh, part of the course. <clears throat> the, the first question to ask is what's the difference between computer engineering and computer science? So we will look at those differences. Um, we will be using the C programming language, so you may want to know why we're using C. And then look um, at more specifics how this semester will unfold. <clears throat> okay, so what's the difference between computer engineering and computer science? Well, if we look at all the elements that uh, make up a computing system, we can start at the bottom with the hardware. So these are the actual circuits that are uh, doing uh, the logic and computation. Uh, layered on top of that is typically an operating system. Uh, so you, it could be Linux, it could be Windows, it could be Mac, you know, OS. And then <clears throat> on top of that will be um, applications. Uh, and then ultimately a user interacting with a particular application. Now the operating system you know talks to the hardware via device drivers and then the application will uh, essentially talk to services the operating system um, provides and then ultimately the user interacts with a particular program and trying to accomplish some particular task. All right, so where does computer engineering and computer science fit in, in into all of this? Well, if we look at the uh, computer science side, uh, we, as a you know rough <coughs> you know rule of thumb, we can think of computer science as dealing with increasing levels of abstraction. So we we try to get a you know further away from you know the the small details. <coughs> in particular as it's associated with the hardware. Um, you, know, you know, one of the jobs of the operating system um, is to, you know, essentially make the application, you know, present to the application a system that is, in a sense, hardware depend um, independent. Uh, you could have this operating system running on any hardware, and from the application point of view, it, it looks like it's the same thing. All right. So, so the big the big question in computer science uh, is what can theoretically be done. You know, what could you imagine that could be done with computational devices? So, this is sort of the direction of thought that um, um, people in computer science uh, tend to go in. Now, on the computer engineering uh, side of things, we are really more fo focused at the hardware level. So there's a decreasing level abstraction because we're essentially going down to, you know, you know, at some point it's it's the bare metal, the actual circuits that are uh, doing the computation. And so the questions that uh, computer engineers ask is, what can practically be done? You know, what can we actually build today, um, or? you know, two years from now? You know, how can we improve the, the circuits? Can we make them faster? Can we make it consume less power? You know, if you're targeting portable devices, you want your battery to last longer. Uh, so this is the realm of computer engineering is the actual hardware that's running your system. All right. <clears throat> So on the computer science side of things, you know, things that they deal with are programming languages, you know, how do you program um, in a particular language, you know, data structures, how do you organize your code and your data, um, you know, algorithms, you know, what, what is the best way to compute something, um, computer architecture, 
you know, how can you organize computer systems, um, computational theories, software engineering? Okay, so these are sort of the high-level targets that uh, computer science uh, is looking at. <coughs> computer engineering, on the other hand, is, you know, dealing with, you know, electronics, um, you know, the digital logic that is uh, running on, you know, transistors, um, you know, algorithms that you could embed in hardware, um, low-level programming, uh, digital signal processing um, <coughs> uh, algorithms, uh, embedded systems. We'll go in a bit on that, but and, and one of the uh, focuses of the electrical and computer engineering department at Montana State is we do focus um, on embedded systems in the department. And then VLSI design and manufacturing. Um, you know, how do you make the, the circuits effectively? Okay, so the, there's an idea of abstraction levels. Um, you know, we, we do that with the computer system, you know, from the hardware to the operating system to applications. Um, and <clears throat> not surprisingly, <coughs> There are languages that you work in when you you are at a particular level um, on the at that abstraction ladder. Uh, if we're dealing with hardware, um, there's a, there is what is known as um, hardware description uh, languages. So here in our department, you know we are we deal with the hardware description language um, VHDL. So HDL in that is it does stand for hardware description language. So there's VHDL and Verilog. Uh, we focus on VHDL. All right, and then you can step up one and machine languages. You know these are the actual bit patterns that uh, encode the instruction set. So this is um, this you know explicitly tells you know what the CPU what to do. Um, but that's, you know, nobody, you know, wants to deal with that, you know, just writing ones and zeros. So we want to abstract that a little bit so then we can go up to assembly languages. So instead of, you know, a pattern of one, zero, one, 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 or whatever it would be for a particular instruction for a CPU, we can just uh, use a word, you know, like add or multiply, um, to say that's the instruction we want, so it's we start uh, coding at a very low level, but it's it's more human readable. <coughs> okay, so and then the assembly languages are typically dedicated to a uh, specific CPU, you know whether it's you know the ARM processor or the Intel x86 architecture, you know, etc. Um, but assembly languages. You, you, it's hard to port to a different CPU, and so that's actually where C came in. Uh, is essentially a portable assembly language, where if you write it in C, you can pretty much target any processor. Um, so in the in the department, we look we typically use C, and at a, at a bit higher level, uh, MATLAB. And then if you go up the abstraction um, ladder, then you start getting into object-oriented programming. Uh, here you're starting to deal with very large systems. You do not want to deal with all the small details because it's too complex. You'll just never, uh, you know, wrap your head around it. You know, this these are projects where you know 100 people or a thousand people are programming a, you know, a large uh, web-based, inter internet-based uh, system. So you need to start hiding the details, and and working in a manner that it's uh, easy to scale up that way. Now since we target embedded systems, we are going to be um, in this mid-level range of the abstraction curve and we will be using the, the C programming language and we, are, we will be targeting an ARM processor and this is essentially the most basic 32-bit processor that you can uh, get a hold of today. All right, so let's look at a bit on uh, embedded systems. <clears throat> 
So an embedded system is essentially a complete computer system. It has memory. It has uh, flash, you know, so it can actually just turn on and start running. Um, you don't have to, I mean, it has its own little boot-up capabilities, but as far as you're concerned, it just turns on and runs. And so it's dedicated to a specific function, and that function is uh, typically part of a larger system. So it provides control, signal, and sensor processing, um, and it typically does this with real-time constraint, meaning the sensor change, so we must immediately uh, react and, and do something because of that. So <clears throat> a couple examples here. Uh, your car that you ride in every day, you know, in the engine, you, you know, you have uh, a controller that's essentially, you know, controlling the amount of air and gas, so it starts easy. Um, you know, back in the day, you know, sometimes if it's cold or, you know, high altitude, then your car would start running rough. Well, we don't have to worry about that uh, anymore because we have a little computer in there that's sensing <clears throat> the amount of oxygen, controlling how much fuel gets injected into the engine. So it's fuel injected and it provides all that timing automatically. So we have a little brain in there just doing that uh, automatically. Um, you know, being able to communicate you know, uh, with the outside world via radio, um, and user settings. There's, so there's a lot of room where uh, microcontrollers can get in, embedded in the car. Um, if we uh, think of more complex systems, you know, we can think of a fighter jet. Um, you know, how can you know the pilot be you know seeing what's around them via radar? You know, you know, controlling their weapon systems. You know, these are much more complicated systems. But again. There are dedicated computers, you know, um, processing sensory information and making decisions based on uh, what's currently happening. And then we can think about robotics, and ultimately someday, you know, we would like a, a robot that can, you know, deal with the world around us just like we do. So mi microcontrollers uh, and microprocessors are the, are the brains of embedded systems. Now, if we think on the uh, automotive side, uh, you know, new cars have a lot of microcontrollers on board. So here's an example where the BMW 7 Series um, is said <coughs> to have up to um, 70 microcontrollers on board. You know, this is everything from, you know, as we discussed earlier, uh, controlling the engine, but you have settings uh, even in your rear view mirror that will change it based on whether it's night or day so you don't have somebody driving behind you with their lights on and that's blinding you. So there's a lot of microcontrollers just looking at a particular sensor and deciding what to do based on that input. Okay, so how many microcontrollers are, are sold each year? Um, there's a lot. Okay, so here in 2010, there was 14 billion microcontrollers sold. Okay, all right, <clears throat> and so they're projecting the markets to keep, you know, growing. Okay, and they're pretty cheap. Um, the average price is a little over a dollar. Here it's a dollar and eight cents. Okay, and they're expecting it to drop a little bit to a dollar five. So if they're expecting it to sit there and then just sort of, you know, flatten out. I mean, it ultimately can't be zero because it does cost something to, to make them. Okay, but they're, but they're cheap and they can be used in a lot of different uh, applications. You know, think of your microwave oven, you know. It's a little computer inside that's controlling how long to, you know, microwave your food at a particular power setting. All right, so here's a um, market study that just recently came out. Um, they estimated that there was 17 billion 
uh, microcontrollers sold in um, 2013. Uh, they say <coughs> that the 32-bit microcontrollers uh, pretty much accounted for a third of the market. And also interesting, um, the automotive market accounted for a third of those microcontrollers. So um, the electronics in your car um, is a big deal these days. And in fact, it's been es estimated that you know a a quarter to a third of the car cost of a new car is the electronics that is put inside. Um, consumer electronics. Um, you know, accounts for 20 percent. Okay, so here, just your gadget that you buy and the car you ride in accounts for about half of these 17 billion microcontrollers that are sold. All right, <clears throat> so how do we uh, program these microcontrollers? Okay, so now we're going to get into uh, C as the programming language. Now, if you go to Wikipedia and look up programming languages, uh, there's something like on the order of 650 or a bit more languages that are listed. And so here is sort of a, <coughs> um, a listing of all the languages kind of in the background and some common ones here at the forefront. But there are a lot of languages uh, listed. So the question is, why C? All right, so uh, the first answer um, is, well, we'll look at is, you know, for historic reasons um, and for reasons we'll get into shortly, C is the most popular programming language. So here's a programming uh, index that they sort of treat, um, track the popularity of uh, programming languages. And we can see that C has yeah, pretty much been holding steady, though it, you know, the measurement is quite noisy. But you know, this month, <clears throat> the ranking for C was 16%, and then the next most popular language, um, Java, at 15%. Okay. Um, here's another variant of C, called, uh, Objective C, that's down here, and then all of a sudden it's booming up. Uh, this is for the um, iPhone, and uh, Apple's language is Objective C for programming apps in the iPhone, so that counts for that rise in uh, popularity. Okay, and that's still a you know a C uh, variant. Okay. So it's it's a very common language. Okay, here's another index, um, language popularity or langpop.com. Again, here we can see that right out here, C is the most um, popular language, and and Java is the the second most popular language. Okay, and uh, here's a firm. Um, uh, Black Duck uh, software. Um, they track uh, active open source projects and what language uh, languages are used in uh, active open source projects. And they have found that again, C is the most dominant language here. And here it's actually by a wide margin. Here they're saying you know 36 percent. And C++, which is the object-oriented version of C, is 12%. And and now, <clears throat> you know, so that's so a C or C-like language. There is, you know, we're talking almost, you know, half the projects are being done in some version of C. Okay, now if we start looking uh, um, explicitly at embedded systems, now so again, these are not your desktop projects or web-based projects. These are projects targeting embedded processors that are essentially have a dedicated task. Okay, and <clears throat> 10 years ago, C was the most um, popular language at about 80%. And if we look at um, in the recent years, uh, again, C 
okay, they, the percentage changed, but I think they uh, change how they are actually measuring it. Um, but again, C is again the most popular language and and seems to be um, growing. Okay, so why is C so dominant as a programming language? Okay, well the the first reason is performance. Uh, if you, if you are writing a program and your driving concern is it needs to be fast or as fast as possible, you typically will think about writing it in C. Um, a lot of times I prototype in MATLAB, you know, get the algorithm down that you want, and then once you know what you want, you know, then it's like, oh, well, can we make it faster? And then you uh, sometimes recode it in C, though MATLAB does have a uh, compiler that can take MATLAB code and turn it into, into C. But if you're really after performance, uh, you'll just uh, code it yourself in C. <coughs> Okay, and C is sort of the right abstraction level for uh, embedded processors because it was designed to model a CPU. Um, so everything you're dealing with maps very well to what the CPU is doing. Uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, support out there and free compilers that you can use. So that makes it popular. Um, if you're dealing with microcontrollers, it typically you can get uh, smaller code size, um, so it can be implemented in, in less memory, which means cheaper devices. Uh, there's there's less overhead um, involved. Um, one thing, when you climb the abstraction ladder, there's typically more overhead in, in the operations um, that have to deal with, you know, hiding the, you know, the details, so to speak. And then ultimately, if you're a startup firm and you're saying, oh, we have this new gadget and we want somebody to program it, well, there's a lot of people that know C. So instead of saying, okay, we need this esoteric language for somebody to use, um, you have an easier time finding people that have that skill set. Okay, so that's, that's really the reason for um, using C and, again, the, the dominant reason for using C is to get performance. All right, so let's now look at how the semester will unfold. <clears throat> uh, the semester is you know, roughly 15 weeks long, and we will divide it into three five-week segments. So the first five-week segment will be um, looking at an introduction to the C programming language. Uh, the second five week, uh, um, we will look at uh, how to program in C the, um, the embedded board that came with your race car. And then the last five weeks, we'll actually be using uh, C to control your Freescale um, Cup race car. Okay, so let's look a bit uh, on the introduction to C side. Okay, so what we will be doing is using Microsoft's Visual Studio to write our C programs. Um, you are welcome to use other uh, uh, C compilers. Uh, however, if, if you need support and don't know quite what you're doing, then you'll need to use Visual Studio. Um, if you already know how to use Linux and can um, <coughs> use your own GCC compiler, <coughs> That sort of implies that you already know what you're doing, so we, we'll just assume that you can get that up and running. However, if you come in and say, I can't get uh, something in Linux working, we'll just say, uh, well, either you get it working yourself or uh, we'll show you how to do it in Visual Studio. Okay, And, that, and that's primarily the reason is, you know, if we have 100 students, uh, we need to limit our uh, so support calls, so to speak, here. Okay. Now all the uh, computers in the labs will have Visual Studio on them, so these first uh, few beginning assignments you can just go in the lab and do them. Uh, you will be able to get a version of Visual Studio um, that you can put on your laptop. And in fact, having your own laptop and then doing it this way is uh, actually the recommended way of doing it. Okay, but until you actually get that installed, uh, 
you can just go to the computer lab that's on the sixth floor of uh, Cobley um, on the southwest corner side. Okay, so uh, the way you'll get uh, the Visual Studio from Microsoft is you'll go to the Microsoft DreamSpark website. So this is the website where uh, essentially the educational versions are uh, uh, given out and downloaded. So watch out for an email that will be sent to you. And essentially, if you look at the subject line, it says an account has been created for you. And it's from you know the DreamSpark Premium. Uh, the, what that will contain is your account information of how you can log into dreamspark.com and uh, be able to get Microsoft products. Um, you know, this is because my uh, MSU has a site license for um, a lot of the Microsoft products. Okay, so when you get done with this course or this, you know, this C programming part of one one, will you be an expert C programmer? Uh, the answer is uh, no. <laughs> okay. Um, will you be an okay C programmer after this course? Uh, maybe it depends on how much effort you put in, but probably not. Okay. Uh, will you get a feel for what it takes to program an embedded system? And the answer is yes, and that's actually the reason for this course is to essentially give you an overview of what embedded systems are all about and how to program them in C. Okay, since this course only introduces you to the C programming language, you will be expected to take a C programming course from the computer science department. So CSCI 112, uh, you will be expected to take that next spring. Okay, and that's the you know full version of a C programming class. This this uh, section of 101 only is an introduction to C programming. Okay, so what's the best way to actually learn how to program? Well, the best way is to actually start programming. Okay, if you want to learn to code, you gotta code. Okay, so just you know, reading a book and and saying, oh, this is what you can do, it it really is not meaningful. The only way really to learn it well is to actually try to build something yourself and program it in C and try to do that. Okay, that's the only way you're really going to learn how to program is by doing it. Okay. Now there are a number of uh, resources out there on the web. If you just uh, go to Google and do a search for C programming or C programming tutorial or learning C, you know something along those lines, uh, a number of resources will pop up. <coughs> okay, there's a couple sites that are essentially devoted to learning C. Um, there's one, um, cprogramming.com. Okay. Uh, another one is this is um, learn code the hard way. Um, they have a C version of it. There's also a Python version of it. Um, and actually, for fairly cheap, um, for twenty nine dollars, you can actually get the videos where he will walk you through a bunch of C coding exercises. And it's entitled "Learn Code the Hard Way" because. Again, the only way you learn is by doing it. So, you know, he wants you to, you know, everything he does, you have to type it as well. And when you do that, it actually sticks with you better. Okay. And then finally, here's a, another one, learnc.org, that is uh, dedicated to learning uh, about C. Okay, so once you sort of get a feel for C and can do it a little bit, <clears throat> we'll then uh, start targeting the embedded board that comes with the race car kit. Um, the actual board that comes with the Freescale Cup uh, race car is the Freescale Freedom Development Platform. Uh, this uh, is a platform where uh, Freescale has a 32-bit uh, processor, and the entire board is is pretty cheap. It only costs thirteen dollars. So if you have other projects you want, you can easily just go to Mauser and buy a board to target any other um, um, you know tasks or projects that you want to do in the future. Okay. Um, 
you know, it, it comes with the ARM Cortex M0 Plus. You know, this is a 32-bit processor, but it's about as simple as they come. It will run at 48 megahertz. You only have 128 kilobytes of flash, which means it's not a lot of uh, storage to store a program. So it's really designed to do simple things. Um, you have very limited onboard uh, memory to work with. And then it comes in an 80 um, an LQPF. Um, that means it's an 80 pin package. So here we can see on the board is the package. The quad flat pack means you'll see these pins sticking out on the sides. And the L means it's a low profile. Okay, and so that contains the entire uh, system. Uh, if you, if you want to know what's actually inside that chip, Here's the CPU part, but it actually con it, uh, contains a number of other things. There's actually memory in there. There's clocks in there. There's system um, uh, resources that you can use. You can actually interface to the external world with analog uh, to digital converters and digital to analog converters. You have timers, so it can actually wake up every so often and check on something. It can communicate with the external world with particular um, interfaces and well as well as custom um, IO okay and so these are sort of the things that you would expect to be in a microcontroller okay to program it in C we will use freescales uh, code warrior um, integrated de um, development environment okay and they actually provide a free version so if you go to this link here you can actually download, uh, and there's a there's a list of a bunch of uh, editions. So you want to find the one that says Special Edition Code Warrior for Microcontrollers. Uh, the latest version, uh, as of today, is 10.6. Um, if you get the offline version, that basically means you'll download everything and don't have to go back over the internet to get anything. Um, this is a pretty big download. It's 1.4 gigabytes. So if you have a limited internet connection, you probably don't want to do it this way. Uh, so what we will do is in the EC office, we'll have a thumb drive that you can come by and just you know copy the uh, the file to your laptop. So just come by when you you know have a chance and just do that. If the office is busy, just go to a neighboring uh, lab and do it. All right. So, what is the overall objectives that we want to uh, want, that we want to ultimately do uh, with this C programming uh, focus? Well, this is the Freescale Cup race car, and the goal is to race along the track here. Okay. So, notice there's a black line in the center. The track is two feet wide. The black line is about an inch wide. Okay, and the objective here is to race your car around this track. Okay. All right. So what do you have to do? Well, notice that all of these cars have a camera. So its job, the camera's job, is to see. Okay, where is that black line on the white background? Okay. So your uh, microcontroller uh, has to see the black line through the camera. And then the job that you have to program is to, one, control the steering, all right? So it, you need to have it follow the black line. And you have to control the speed, because if you go too fast, you'll just slide off a corner. And of course, if you go too slow, uh, you won't win the race. Okay, so the objective is to see the black line, control the steering, and then control the speed so that you stay on the track and then ultimately win the race. <coughs> okay, so so what do we uh, what do we expect you to do each week? Okay, so this is a general outline of what you'll need to be doing. Okay, there'll be um, an online lecture that you need to watch uh, like this one. After each lecture, there'll be a quiz that you'll take on D2L on the lecture material. Uh, the, uh, there will be a programming assignment that will be given as part of the, the lecture material, so you'll need to start working on that. 
And you need to work on that uh, right away uh, because before you show up to your recitation section, you will need to upload any, uh, you know, whatever code you've developed so far um, to the Dropbox, okay? And when you do that, you'll also be asked a, a code survey question uh, asking if you have any issues with, with um, um, your programming assignment. And the reason for that is when you get to the recitation section, we will know, you know, what some of the, you know, problems uh, students are having so we can address those at the beginning of the recitation section. Okay, so then you'll come to the recitation section and if you're all done, you just demonstrate your code and you're done. Um, or you will have uh, a two-hour block there where you can get help if you're stuck and it is is expected that you will um, ask for help there. Now you don't know if you're stuck if you haven't tried to program it before then so this is really the reason for uploading your attempted code before the recitation section is yeah, you you have to try it before you really know whether you're stuck somewhere okay and then the recitation section is to help you if you're stuck okay so that's to get you to do it before you actually show up and then ultimately, when, once you've demoed your uh, uh, code and it's working, then you'll upload the final source code to the Dropbox that you've uh, well commented. Okay, and then ultimately, um, this will culminate in you know the, the race event at the end of the so semester. Now, it is highly recommended that you have your own laptop because yeah, then you can install your own version of Code Warriors and work on programming your car in your dorm room. Um, however, if you don't, uh, all uh, lab computers in the department have the code as well, so you'll be able to come into the computer lab and do it. Okay, so finally, just sort of a uh, thought here for how computers relate to the human experience. Um, if, if we go back, you know, 5,000 years, you know, roughly 3,000 B.C., um, this was sort of the uh, beginning of written history, okay? So if we go um, over this 5,000-year uh, range, uh, computers really have only showed up in the last uh, 68 years. And the first electronic uh, computer, ENIAC, uh, it was it was a it was a monster here. So we had seventeen thousand vacuum tubes. The whole thing weighed <clears throat> thirty tons. Okay, it took up eighteen thousand square feet of floor space. So this is you know a size of a typical house. It consumed one hundred fifty kilowatts of power. So this is enough power that could power twenty five homes. And it was slower than your cheap pocket calculator or 0 0.05 MIPS which is really slow okay but that was the beginning okay and only 68 years later right you now have a smartphone that is, was you know that's as capable as a desktop computer 10 years ago and you can put that in your pocket and you can have a flash drive that stores 128 gigabytes and you can put that in your pocket so things have changed a lot in just a short period of time so ultimately the question is what will the future bring and more importantly is how will you shape the future uh, with computers so good luck in this course, and uh, I hope this is the start of a very interesting um, career that deals with uh, computers. So best of luck in 101.